Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I am blown away by the resources that have been shared today, and I know that everybody will find this super valuable. And so I'm just happy to, to be here today. So as Tori mentioned, my name's Amber, and um, my background's really in mental health, and I support um, primarily older adults and seniors as they are developing a cognitive impairment and moving through the season of dementia. And so I was asked to talk a little bit today about what's truly going on both psychologically and, um, and neurologically for somebody um, with a developing cognitive impairment and why that's going to have and create a psychological pull um, and susceptibility um, to these scams and how we can support our seniors. So um, I'm fortunate to be here. I think we have some of our LCV communities watching from Vermont. So saying hello to the residents at Otter Creek and Shelburne Bay and Quarry Hill, waving to you from New Hampshire and look forward to a time I get to see you guys again soon. So this, my session is really catered more to the support person, um, the, the adult child, um, or whatever support person is working with our older adult or seniors, particularly as they're developing a cognitive impairment. So we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Um, but if you are a senior watching this, hopefully this will give you some preventative measures to, to support yourself and keep yourself safe from these sorts of things. So this, this 40, next 45 minutes to an hour is gonna look a little bit like this. We're gonna talk a lot about the progression of vulnerability. Um, what is the aging brain? What does that look like? What is mild cognitive impairment? How is that different from dementia? And how does that it potentially increase um, or definitely increase that vulnerability for a loved one as uh, related to these scams? And then of course, the psychology of the aging brain. As we age, different things happen to the neuroscience behind it, and thus uh, the behaviors that go with that. So we're going to look around. We're going to look a lot about that and why seniors again are susceptible. And a true piece of this um, is the power of emotions. And we're going to talk about how, with a cognitive impairment, emotions actually become the louder voice than maybe linguistic language. And so we're going to dive a little bit into that as well. And then person-centered, really acknowledging the role our seniors play, not only with their finances, but also with their loved ones around them. And how habits and person-centered approach um, can help us kind of create a support system to really keep our, our seniors safe. And hopefully some tips and communication styles and language to help support our seniors. And again, I mean, this blown away by the resources that have been shared by all the partners today. Um, so hopefully today you'll take away more of a, some communication style. And again, the content, the context of what's happening to the brain, what's happening to the body um, that's creating some of this susceptibility. So let's, let's start with kind of the progression, the progression of vulnerability and looking first at natural aging and what does that even look like? What does that mean and how is that different? So almost 40% of people over the age of 65 have some sort of memory loss or some sort of cognitive confusion. So dementia is not a natural form of aging. Um, oftentimes we just think as we age, our brain atrophies like our muscles and we develop dementia. And that, that's not true. It's truly not a natural form of aging. But about 40% of folks over that 65 um, year old age will experience some level of cognitive confusion that is normal. Um, that is, and that's, like I said, different than a true diagnosable dementia. So, it's, it, so we wanna look at, is it age-related cognitive impairment or is it something else? And so as we age, we're gonna notice subtle changes in memory. Um, they, they occur naturally as the aging process. And if there's no medical condition, if there's really no underlying medical condition causing this, we would call, call this age-associated memory loss. Um, if there's something more medical going on, it may be something that would be a reversible dementia, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but mild cognitive impairment, so this word kind of gets thrown around, it does not fall under that natural aging process. Mild cognitive impairment, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, is kind of that middle of the road. Um, it's not dementia, it's not a natural form of aging, but it does make our seniors very susceptible to scams like these, in particularly almost that middle MCI stage 
the most susceptible in my opinion, and we'll talk about why. Um, so again, normal age-related cognitive impairment doesn't prevent one from living a fruitful life. And that's kind of that determinant. Are they still able to carry out skills and abilities throughout the day? Um, are they still able to pay bills on their own, get from point A to point B, per, for the most part, remember things from day to day? Um, that's typically going to be a natural progression. Um, but when cognitive problems begin to consistently interfere with normal daily functioning activities um, of the normal day to day, that's when it's probably not a natural form of aging and we wanna look a little deeper. And so again, this, this is that second stage, that next stage of vulnerability, and that's mild cognitive impairment. That stage in between, um, between that expected cognitive impairment of normal, uh, more normal aging and dementia. So we're not, we're, we're not all the way to dementia yet, and it may not be that somebody develops, when somebody develops MCI, they may never develop dementia. There is an increased risk um, that of somebody with MCI to get Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. Doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. Um, but we will notice a slight uh, measurable decline in cognitive abilities, including memory and thinking skills. So I've highlighted here, um, and, and throughout the course of the, this session, you'll see I've bolded some sections that really increase, again, that vulnerability and susceptibility to falling for these scams. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, somebody with mild cognitive impairment, they're going to be aware that their memory has slipped. They're going to be aware that they're becoming more forgetful. And family and close friends are also going to notice that. Um, somebody with a true diagnosable dementia may not have an awareness that, they're, that they have a cognitive impairment, but somebody with MCI will, will be aware, they're going to want to get support. But the biggest piece of this, somebody with mild cognitive impairment, these, these changes, these cognitive changes are not severe enough to significantly interfere with their daily life. So they're still going to be able to have independence to make a phone, a phone um, credit card transaction or to send money somewhere or to meet someone somewhere. So they're still able to carry out that independence, but they're maybe less able to identify that it's a scam. We're going to talk about some psychological reasons why with what's happening to the brain and the aging process in a, in a few slides. So, so again, that's going to increase some vulnerability for them. Um, and here's the, here's the big thing that I, I always like to share. One of the, so LCB, we're so fortunate. We have um, a partnership with Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and they give us, they inform us with so much research and knowledge. And one of the things they talk about is in their studies, if we don't use it, we lose it. And so we really adopted this tech, this technique of keeping active and engaged residents. And so whether it's somebody in the aging process or you or I um, as a support person, we notice that if we are engaged throughout our day, if we're living an active, fruitful life across what we call four pillar model, socially, emotionally, physically, and cognitively, what the research is showing is that it may slow down or decrease this, the risk of developing a cognitive impairment. Now, we know with Alzheimer's disease, there currently is no cure, there's no treatment, and there's no prevention. Um, but what we do know is that if we do something physically active every day, we do something socially every day, which I know in COVID is much harder. If we um, tap into our emotional self every day and we challenge our brain cognitively at least one to two times a day, hitting all those pillars, we're going to actually see a decrease in the progression of a cognitive impairment. The reason I'm saying this is because if you are a support person, if you are an adult child, if you're a senior yourself, making sure you're tapping into those four pillars, if you're starting to notice some cognitive impairment, is going to help you um, stay more on task, stay more present in the, in the day to day, and it may help you stay a little more alert to maybe catching some of this. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So keeping our brains and bodies active. So again, I've highlighted some of these challenges with mild cognitive impairment that may increase um, the risk or the vulnerability or susceptibility for somebody with, um, for the, with these scams. And so here are some symptoms. I don't have to go through all of them, 
Um, but someone with MCI will forget recent events or they may forget recent events. They may be repeating the same thing over and over or they may forget appointments and planned events occasionally. One of the biggest pieces here is that they may misunderstand conversations. Um, we're going to talk in a few slides about um, the brain and what's happening to the hippocampus, which is that um, memory, logic, reason center of the brain. And because with mild cognitive impairment, there begins to be some um, impairment of the hippocampus, they may misunderstand a conversation. So if somebody's calling, saying they're in trouble, saying that they need money, um, they may misunderstand the true content behind it. Another piece of this has trouble coming up with desired words. So as we age, we may develop some word finding difficulties called anomia. Um, sometimes it can progress into aphasia with the, the ability, losing the ability to speak. But what can happen is when um, a loved one is having a trouble, if they're having trouble coming up with a desired word, they may do one of two things. They may retreat and become agreeable. And so if they're having a hard time on a phone, and I'm using the example, guys, of a, of a phone call of a family member, and I'm going to use that example throughout the course of this to make it simple. Um, I'm going to talk about a true example that did happen in my family. But if they're having, if they're experiencing anomia, they're having a hard time coming up with a desired word, they may retreat and become agreeable and just move forward with it out of anxiety um, to do so. They may need to write um, reminders down or they'll forget. So maybe these scams are happening quite often, the attempted scams, um, things coming through an email. I loved that YouTube video that was shared with, with seniors learning Facebook and YouTube. My gosh, that was amazing. Um, but they may be forgetting that it's happening and so they may not be telling their support systems. They may not be telling their adult child. So we're gonna talk in a, in a little bit about how we can kind of get ahead of that. Um, they may struggle to complete complex tasks like paying bills or taking medications, but for the most part, somebody with MCI can pretty much still be independent in their day. And that's that biggest piece at the bottom. They have some important memory impairment, but can still function independently, which really, again, increases that vulnerability to um, these scams being carried out. Um, because they may have less of a support team, um, but they're still having these cognitive challenges. So, so we've kind of talked about natural aging, we've talked about mild cognitive impairment, and now this kind of next progression of vulnerability is dementia. I could talk for seven hours on this slide, <laughs> so we're not going to do that, but we're just going to do a quick overview of what is dementia and why are our seniors susceptible to these scams if this is occurring. Um, I like to give just a quick overview of dementia here. That's my expertise. And so a lot of people ask me, um, is Alzheimer's disease and dementia the same thing? So I just wanna say for those of you on, this, on the um, chat today that wonder that, um, it, it, Alzheimer's disease is a disease that has a symptom of dementia. There are over 100 different diseases that cause dementia, and dementia itself is a symptom that just notes cognitive decline. It's a general term for a decline in mental ability, poor judgment, um, disorientation, maybe short attention span, and of course, memory loss. And so as you can see from the picture, it's really a true umbrella term. And I talk about this next piece because I think it can be eye-opening um, as a support person, as a loved one, as a caregiver to really dive deep into some of this. So we have what's called an, an irreversible dementia, which would be some sort of a diagnosable disease that has a symptom of memory loss, dementia, um, that is non-curable, it's, pro it's um, progressive. And of course, Alzheimer's disease being that most common type, of, of those 100 types of diseases um, that have that symptom of dementia, Alzheimer's makes up for about 60 to 80 percent of that. So it's a vast majority, but there are so many others. Um, and I named some here. One of the things to note about frontal temporal dementia, which actually can impair, um, can, can have an early onset, and some people can develop frontal temporal dementia as early as 40s and 50s, um, but it impairs somebody's ability to understand social cues. 
And so that can really increase susceptibility, especially if it's a scam that's happening over the phone or in person um, attempted scam because those social cues are a little off. And so we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So irreversible dementias, there are a bunch of them. Today's not a dementia talk, um, but there are some of them there and I'm happy to answer any questions if there is any. But the other piece of this is somebody could have a reversible dementia called delirium. So maybe they're living on their own, they're in their natural aging process, but they, are, they develop a fever or a UTI and they become cognitively confused. And so working in senior living, that's actually where we see the most danger because this is a typical resident who's able to carry out the milieu of their day. They're able to maintain their skills and abilities quite fine, but then they get a UTI and they become extremely confused. And maybe they try to drive their car and they get lost um, or the like. And so you could understand how that would truly increase that vulnerability here. The difference with delirium is once it's treated, so once the UTI is treated with antibiotics or once dehydration is cured with um, getting that hydration in, or if somebody is on a new cocktail of medication and it hasn't quite balanced itself out yet, once it finally does, that delirium will reverse and that person will go back to their baseline. Of course, the struggle here is if there was some sort of scam that was attempted during a time of delirium and that could make um, the resident, the loved one, our seniors, older adults, extremely susceptible um, to following through with it or becoming a victim of it. And so again, um, quickly, just some symptoms of dementia. Again, this, this will kind of, I could talk about this all day, but obviously all the same symptoms we saw with mild cognitive impairment, but it, it then, and then it increases. So somebody with dementia is really going to have a harder time completing more daily tasks. And of course, it depends on their um, level of dementia and where they are and what we call the GDS scale, uh, they're going to lose insight or awareness of their memory loss. So we're, we never want to reality orient somebody who has a, 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 you know, a progressive dementia. We're going to talk about how um, a support person has to be really cognizant of that um, to make sure that we're still able to be supportive of them. And it was talked about a little bit on the previous presentation, which was great. So we'll dive into that in just a minute. Um, so they may, they may they, of course, we have that poor judgment, of course, memory, language, and cognition, decline in rational thinking, and the ability to problem solve. So here's a really big piece of this. So while somebody with memory impairment, they may not have the same independence, depending on where they're at, I could get on the global deterioration scale, which measures where somebody is at on a um, levels of dementia. If they're early on the GDS scale, they may have the ability to independently complete tasks. Somebody lower on the GDS scale or somebody starting to come to a place where maybe they should be living in a community that has more assistance, they may not be able to complete a transaction, a money wiring over the phone. Um, maybe they try to pull out their checkbook because that's what they've always been used to. Maybe they will forget in a few minutes or in a few hours that that scam was attempted and they're not able to, um, to portray this to their loved ones. But what's gonna happen is they're going to still feel the emotion of fear. Um, they're still gonna feel confused and they're still gonna have that remnants that something intense happened. And I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the psychology of the brain in just a minute. Um, so it's important for us to kind of keep tabs on that, especially if this is somebody that's living alone um, or who is, even if they are living in a memory, um, excuse me, uh, an assisted living community, but have their own phone number, have their own access to those things. So the psychology of the aging brain. Really, in a nutshell, the way we can just to look at this and describe this is to talk about the limbic system. And so really, this is why scams hit below the belt. <laughs> this is why they can um, really be dangerous for somebody who is in the middle of a cognitive impairment. So the emotion center of our brain, this amygdala, we're going to talk about that first. That's the part of our brain that regulates fight or flight. Um, that's the part of our brain that gives us our emotional based memory. That's the part of the brain that if you smelled a warm apple pie, it may make you think of your grandmother's house and you might feel comforted. Or if you heard a song 
um, from your wedding day, you might remember that emotion. Or if sometimes smells or, or different songs can be triggering and it may bring up trauma and the like. And so that's really in the amygdala. That's the amygdala function. And then we have the hippocampus that controls our memory, our logic, our critical thinking. And these two kind of work in tandem together and they work off of each other, both in um, the aging process, but also with a cognitive impairment. The way that I can best describe the way these two parts of the brain work off of each other is to share with you, I was in a car accident. I was in a hit and run accident years and years ago. I was okay, I got up, I walked off of from the scene, but it, my car was totaled, it, it wasn't a good situation. And so what, what happened when the police officer came to interrogate me about what had happened, um, they were asking me all these questions that I couldn't answer, like, you know, the car that hit me and, and, and left, what color was the car? What did the driver look like? How many people were in the car? Did you get a license plate? Uh, what direction did they go in? I had no recollection of that because my, what happens, and this happens in trauma as well, when somebody experiences a trauma, the hippocampus, that, that memory center, almost takes a back seat to protect the brain from all that intensity that just happened but the amygdala becomes stronger. And so what I could remember was the sound that of the other car hitting my car and the, the sound of it. I could remember the impact that I felt as my, you know, my body went forward. And then as it went backward, I could remember the wind going in my hair and seeing the, the sky. And I could remember the song that was playing, but I couldn't remember the details. And really that's because of the, the way that the amygdala and the hippocampus play off of each other. But what happens with memory loss is it is a cognitive um, degeneration of the brain. So the hippocampus that controls that cognition, that memory center, that logic, that really begins to degenerate. But the amygdala doesn't. The amygdala actually becomes the louder voice. The amygdala actually becomes the piece of it. And this is why if you, you know, if you have a loved one or you've been with somebody who has dementia, they may not be able to remember you or recall anything from yesterday or a few years prior. They may have lost their ability to speak, but if they play a song from their youth, they're able to sing every word. And that's because, you know, that, that music lies in our amygdala and that's that full brain function. So scams really pick up on the emotion-based piece of this. So the, the loved one might not be, or the, the older adult might not be able to be picking up on the conversation or the content as much as they're picking up on the emotion behind it. And so the next slide will kind of dive into what I mean. Oh, first this slide, forgot about this slide. <laughs> we'll do this slide first. So we use this at LCB to when we're doing our trainings with um, any of our frontline associates that are working with our residents to really help them have a visual for the hippocampus versus the amygdala. And why is there that gravitational pull towards scams? Hopefully this visual will help you, um, help you see this. And this visual is tapping into your amygdala more than your hippocampus in hearing me talk about it. So you're gonna see some bookshelves here. So if you look, I, the words are, might be small to see, but if you look at the first one, the, the, the top one, that's a healthy brain, you or I, you'll see on the left side is the hippocampus, logic, fact, reason. On the right side is the amygdala, our feelings and our emotional based memories. So the healthy brain, for the most part, you'll see that those books are fully functioning, they're intact. If somebody has trauma in their history, it might look a little bit different, but for the most part, um, the hippocampus and the amygdala are functioning in tandem quite well. If you look at early stage dementia now at the bottom, you'll see that the books on the top shelf, a few have fallen off. Now that's those short-term memories. Short-term memories are dissipating. Um, they may forget that if their scam phone call came through. They may forget that you visited yesterday. Um, things like that. But if you look at the amygdala on the right side, there's been no change. So you'll see as the aging brain progresses, the hippocampus starts to deteriorate. In this case, you'll see no change in the amygdala. So the emotion part of the brain, the sensory part of the brain becomes the most powerful. 
And then you can see here, um, this is as we progress through the disease process. At, if you look at the top one there on the right hand side, that's mid stage dementia. And you'll see a decent amount of books that have um, continued to fall off. And this is maybe more memory loss. This may not be somebody living in a senior living yet, um, it, or in a memory care neighborhood yet, excuse me, but they, maybe there was a recent death of a spouse and that was forgotten. Um, or maybe um, instead of thinking it's 2020, we're thinking it's 1980. But if you look at the amygdala, the amygdala only has a couple books that have fallen. So the degeneration again is so different. This is why it's so, so important to not reality orient somebody with memory impairment because they truly do feel like they're living in 1980. And if we are telling them it's 2020 and they've just been scammed, um, that's gonna create a high level of fear, um, a high level of an end confrontation and they may push you away, which is what you don't want. So we're gonna talk about some, some ideas and how to support that. And then lastly, late stage dementia, guys. This is um, really late stage. You'll see the hippocampus is degenerating. Um, this is where um, maybe finances and things like that may be, um, it's important to know who it was left to. Somebody at this stage is really end of life. Um, they may be um, a lot of our, our residents or a lot of folks in late stage dementia. You'll see the books have fallen all the way down to childhood based memories. And that's why oftentimes we'll hear someone with cognitive impairment at this level um, looking, be looking for their parents, looking for their mommies and their daddies. But if you see um, that amygdala function, yes, it's a brain degenerative disease. So we do see some change in the amygdala. But um, for the most part, those bookshelves, um, there's no comparison to what's happening to the hippocampus. So I think that I've made my point. <laughs> but let's look at what this looks like now. Um, so this is what the senior is going to hear based on all of that when we have a cognitive impairment. This is the true psychology of it. So keeping in mind that emotional brain dominance that we discussed, and this is a true example. So this is something that really did happen in uh, my family. Um, and so using this as, as a perfect example. So what is said by the scammer? Uh, important or familiar people or family names. It's your grandson, Tony. So what is triggered or what is heard um, for the senior or the older adult is, Tony, I care about this person, triggers the emotions. Um, and then what would the scammer do next? They say some sort of a negative situation, I'm in jail, which is what was said to um, the, this family member of mine. And so then what happens is the fight or flight response of the amygdala kicks in because it's the more dominant part of the brain. Um, the other part of the brain is deteriorating, so they're pulling on that. And it says, so uh, what, the, what the loved one hears is, I need help. So it's your grandson, Tony, I care about this person. I'm in jail, I need to help is what's heard. And so then really using that scammer is smart and it's pulling on that emotional brain dominance. I need money for bail, I don't know who else I can call. And so what happens is when we go into a fight or flight response, when we turn into fight, we go into action. And so what that's, that um, older adult is going to say is, how do I get Tony money? So that's kind of what's going on psychologically when, the, when these things are happening. Going back to the progression, the three stages, the, the aging brain, natural aging, one, they may have the cognition to, com, com, to provide a credit card um, transaction right over the phone, or um, where do I send money to, right? Because they're more independent, but they're still having some amygdala um, dominance happening there. Then if we move into cognitive impairment, they still may be able to follow, out, follow that out, but they may forget to tell someone about it. And they may become, continue to become more susceptible. Even in early stage dementia, somebody may be able to complete these tasks based on the amygdala function, but if they're not, if they're not able to, if they've lost those skills and abilities, like I said before, what happens is rather than the linguistic based memory or the, the contact based memory, what comes up is an emotional memory, fear, sadness, confusion. Um, and so they may not act on it, but that scammer may really be able to prey on that. They may be able to understand that. And so that loved one is going about their day feeling that fear and sadness because the emotional base memory stays, even though that, um, that cognitive memory had dissipated. And so the really, really, really important thing 
is to look at how we can add supports, um, especially to somebody in later stages. Okay, so again, the power, and I do have a PowerPoint that has um, more detail in this that I can certainly give to Galen and Tori that can, you guys can, can have as well. So, um, but again, that louder voice, what's heard. So here's some additional variables that we really want to think about when working with a senior who especially has a cognitive impairment as it relates to this. So hearing loss. We know that our seniors are more susceptible to age-related hearing loss. And they may not be able to identify the voice that it's fraudulent. They may not be able to identify that, but they cling to the emotion of the voice. And so that age-related hearing loss is going to play a part, of course, in susceptibility. And then looking at cognitive impairment and dementia as it relates to language. So with a developing cognitive impairment or dementia, one, somebody can drop one to three words out of a four-word sentence depending on the severity of the impairment. And I'm just gonna say that again, they can drop one to three words out of a four word sentence, depending on the severity of their cognitive impairment. So it may truly be that all they heard was Tony jail and they wanna help, right? And, and when we've, we're starting to lose our ability to find words um, and we're, we're acting off of fight or flight, we may not ask more questions because the cognition um, allows us to retreat and become agreeable, the lack of cognition in that moment. Um, so really important for us to know that um, even somebody in a natural aging process can drop a few words of a sentence because of the hippocampus and that age-related hearing loss um, kind of having some deficits. And then the environment, you know, I, I think about um, I think about my grandparents and, you know, seniors that I love and know in our communities and typically they have their radio up quite loud or their TV is on loud so they can hear it. Um, they might be wearing a hearing aid, which is picking up all of this background noise, making it difficult to catch the whole story. Um, so making it difficult to catch if the caller is fraudulent. And again, of course, increasing that susceptibility and need for us to implement supports. So person-centered, um, what's under their iceberg? So we really need to acknowledge some things outside of just cognition when we're working with our seniors and with scams. Um, and, and this plays a little bit on how dementia works too, but Kelly McCarthy, who's actually um, LCV's Director of Memory Care and Engagement, she wrote this amazing book called The Brass Ring Memoirs. And it's a, it's a book written for caregivers, um, home-based caregivers, community-based caregivers, and the like um, to support their loved one working through a dementia diagnosis. And it's an awesome book that's written into metaphor. And in, in her book, she talks about this concept of what's under someone's iceberg and what does that mean? And so if you look at an iceberg and what you know from an iceberg, the really only a very small amount is at the surface. The crux of what that, where that iceberg is, is below the surface. And so we're the same way. Um, you guys are gonna know a, ver a small snapshot about me um, in this 45 to a minute to an hour session, but you're not gonna know truly who I am because that's below the surface. Um, we all have it. We all have the good things that we love to share. We all have the bad things that maybe we wish didn't happen. And we all have those ugly things that we hope to God nobody ever finds out, right? And that's the core of who we are. But what's also under our iceberg are our habits, our routines, the things that we've done our whole life, what makes us who we are. And so with memory loss, what, there's a concept called first in, last out. And what that means is if you think of an 18-wheeler, the first things that go in are the last things to come out and memories and habits and routines are the same way. So if, if, there's a, if, some, if a senior has always been tight with their money, they never were one to donate money, they never were one to help out family or friends, maybe they, they're pretty low on the susceptibility um, even with a cognitive impairment, maybe not, um, but something to look at. I think about my parents, you know, my mom is, anytime there's a GoFundMe, she's the first one to wanna donate. She wants to help out families, right, her, her, um, family members. And so she may be susceptible, right, because that's something she's always done. 
And so with memory loss, all of that stuff below the surface in this iceberg rises to the top. And we don't have the ability to kind of pick and choose what we share with the world. But when our habits and routines are that ingrained, um, sometimes we'll, that will just become an automatic. We're gonna talk in a minute about how we can shift and change our habits and routines. Um, but another piece is, is there, is there a family history of somebody needing support? Is there a family history of somebody getting in trouble, of somebody having financial stress? And so, of course, we know that scammer can prey on that. Um, and if this was a loved one who's always provided support to this person or to other people in their history, then it makes them, of course, more susceptible. So we just really need to look at um, not just the cognition, but also what's under someone's iceberg and the role that they played in finances in the past. And so again, habits. Um, how has this person been with donations, financial support? Was, and you know, a big piece is, was the deceased spouse, is there a deceased spouse who was the sole financial planner? And I'm sure that's been talked about. And now we have somebody else trying to take this on. I think about uh, my husband's grandmother. This is the situation with her you know, where she was the Betty homemaker. She cooked and she cleaned and she raised the family, but she didn't have her hands in the finances. And now that he has passed, she's trying her best to do that. And she, without my father-in-law, her son, she would have become, uh, totally would have become susceptible to these scams. And that's what the, the example before was about. And then if we add a cognitive impairment on top of that, um, it's only increasing tenfold. And so looking at that level of, of vulnerability again. And so independence. So, so two pieces with this, you know, how independent is this person in carrying out these, these um, potential scams? But also as somebody develops a cognitive impairment, something that we typically see behaviorally is that they may retreat and withdraw from, from loved ones because they're fearful that they're going to notice um, that the cognitive impairment and they're gonna take action. They're gonna um, do something about it. And so if somebody is in that natural aging process or is at the beginning stage of mild cognitive impairment and they're still aware that they have um, some sort of an impairment, they're going to withdraw from families, which increases that vulnerability because family members not, may not be aware of what's going on. They may not see um, that this is happening. They may not be communicating with their loved one as much um, because of that withdrawal. So important for us to look at that too. Just, you know, it's very common that we see um, loved ones, you know, trying to, trying to stay away. Um, what is the history of entrusting with others? You know, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, what is the history of them giving financial um, support to people when in trouble? And are, is something in their history, have they, how do they owe someone money? Um, or have they been somebody that's been in debt? And so now they're fearful that, that if they don't fix this now, so we really just gotta look at the habits. Moral of the story, <laughs> no triggers, no habits, and be proactive. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we can be proactive and support um, support our loved ones. I'm just looking at time, Tori, so, okay. Um, so the last piece of this is communication and language to help support your loved one, the first person you're working with, and support our seniors. So first and foremost, we want to approach this with, in a, dig with a dignified approach. Kelly in her book talks about a concept called the a peacock moment. And it's about approaching communication um, with somebody with a cognitive impairment in a dignified way and walking away from it saying, did I just help make them feel proud, beautiful, and confident and ensuring that we made them feel empowered in the communication style rather than demeaned. What I mean by that is if we're, you know, you as a loved one, especially if you're an adult child watching this, you have your own emotions. You want to protect your parent or your loved one or your, or your spouse or whoever this is. Um, and so you're coming at it with your own emotion. And so important for us to um, kind of take some deep breaths and approach it in a way so that the person with the cognitive impairment still feels um, proud, beautiful, and confident and empowered in the situation. Because what's going to happen if they don't is, again, they're going to retreat from you, um, they're going to push you away, and they're going to have a sense of not wanting to talk about it anymore. And that's not what we want. We want them to, uh, we really want them to be open and honest about these things. And it may be that 
may have more anxiety about that cognitive impairment that you're noticing and less about the actual scam that's going on. And so are you noticing changes? So we need to set resources up um, so that we have more eyes on deck. So I think about, again, my husband's grandmother. She lives in Pennsylvania. My in-laws live in New Hampshire. Um, and she's, uh, she's a widow and she's living at home trying to figure all this out. And so he, my father-in-law has set up um, home health to come and, and help her administer medication. And she, he set up meal services that deliver to her home. And he talks to the neighbors and friends um, and people from church that can go over and check on her. Again, it's time of COVID and it's so much different now with visiting folks, especially our seniors. Um, so he found a way to have um, um, a, a FaceTime so that he can kind of chat with her, which again, um, is a way to kind of just kind of put more resources, more eyes on deck, and he communicates with them. So, so if you're noticing changes, let's set up more resources to catch it. Um, and so remembering that that amygdala is the higher functioning brain at this point, we really want to ensure that we're practicing techniques that are calming the amygdala function and allowing a scam to be recognized. And it's really twofold. It's one for our for the senior, for the older adult to have some um, ability to calm that amygdala function and not react off of fight or flight. But it's also for the support person, especially if it's a family member who's having their own fear and emotions. And so these are just some some quick um, some quick techniques that you can use. Simply a psychological techniques um, that you can use to support this. So again remembering that it's about a habit. So it's all of our habits and our routines are ingrained in us. So we want to pick up on things that that we will quickly go to. So I think for me, you know, when I'm I came from a family of prayer. And so when I'm in a distressing moment, I immediately go to prayer. It's a habit. That's what we've always done. That's what we do. It's a grounding technique for me. So the, the cool thing about creating habits is it takes 21 days to make or break a habit for you or I. For somebody with a cognitive impairment, it actually takes only 35 days. So somebody with a cognitive impairment can still develop new skills, new habits. And so if we, if we implement some of these things, knowing that these things are happening and we're trying to catch them, approaching them with a more calm mind, a more calm amygdala is gonna be helpful. So diaphragmatic breathing, I'm not gonna give you, you know, all of these, I, I can certainly give handouts and what those are. But again, I'm here to talk about the psychology behind this and how to support the psychology behind this. So diaphragmatic breathing is a technique that helps bring someone from their sympathetic nervous system, which is their fight or flight, to their parasympathetic nervous system, which is that um, relaxation stage. So it's, it's a technique of breathing through your nose, starting from your diaphragm and working your way up and not vice versa, not starting in your chest and breathing down, but breathing up. And it's important for us to breathe through our nose because when we breathe through our mouth, it actually triggers the sympathetic nervous system, um, almost like a panic attack. And that's typically why people do that when they're having panic. So, so practicing three to five minutes a day with your loved one, with your, for yourself, diaphragmatic breathing um, is actually going to help the body and the brain go to the parasympathetic nervous system quicker if it's a habit, if it's done consistently throughout the day. Um, each day. And so making that a self-care tactic. And so if that this sort of thing happens, the fight or flight response goes off, the amygdala wants to help this person on the other line. Maybe what can happen in this space is that we'll, we'll react in a more sound mind um, because we've been practicing these grounding techniques. And of course, another grounding technique is a five senses tool where you call upon something you can see, something you can smell, something you can taste, something you can feel. What's the other one? Something you can hear. And that grounds someone. Um, like I said, prayer for me. I mean, I just had a distressing moment with my three-year-old toddler this morning trying to get her ready for the day. And she had a tantrum. And my first reaction to calm myself to be a better caregiver for her was to go to prayer because that's my habit. That's my grounding technique. And so these things just need to be implemented every day. Progressive muscle relaxation is the ability to um, take a muscle group and squeeze it and hold it, take a deep breath for you know three to five seconds and release it. We hold stress hormones in our muscles. So when we squeeze them and hold them with the act of deep breath, 
it releases it. So no, I'm not saying if there's a scam call or if somebody shows up at the door to squeeze your muscles and release them. But what I am saying is that if we implement these supports and self-care tactics um, into the day with our loved ones or even for ourselves, it's gonna help us react in a different way when something intense happens. Um, like a scam. And it may help a loved one, you know, become less susceptible if they're reacting more in a grounded state in their parasympathetic nervous system. And then, of course, conceding. We've talked about this and um, Debbie mentioned it before. Uh, conceding if it gets heated. You don't want them to be pushing you away. Um, you don't want them to feel like you, um, that you're blaming them for anything, that you're noticing this cognitive impairment and now we must do something about it. You want them to feel supported by you um, so that you can catch any susceptibility of these scams and vulnerability to them. And then of course have a, a team approach to it. Um, so conceding. And then the last piece is setting up a support system. And we've talked a little bit about this and it's kind of been said a lot and you've been given a plethora of resources, but I truly mean in your, your network, in your own social family network. I always share when when I'm doing work with families and they've said, you know, my loved one, my, my, my wife was just diagnosed with dementia, I don't know how I'm going to do this on my own. Uh, the advice I always give is think of five people you can call that, and say to, to them, um, my wife was just diagnosed with dementia and I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I'm going to need some help. Would you be willing to be one of those people I could call on? They're gonna say yes or they're gonna say no, but the cool thing you can do is you can really access this in supporting, um, supporting the, the senior or the adult, um, uh, the, older, the older adult in this. So five people you could call and say, mom is getting scam calls. Uh, would you be willing to be um, somebody that I could put on a list that she could call um, if this were to happen? I'm always getting these calls. I don't know if this is gonna, if I'm gonna be able to be um, there for her, but so that when these happen, rather than your loved one immediately going forth, rather they're gonna call somebody on that list. So five people you can call, have the numbers ready, have the method handy, have it on the, the refrigerator or the on the phone, or right, if, if they are using a cell phone, um, in the cell phone or on the pantry so that so that it's happening and again tag teaming like my like my in-laws do tag teaming that those check-ins um who's going to drop off food to mom tonight um where are we going who's going to call mom tonight and those sorts of things so again what are those um the sustainable support systems that safety net because here's the, the last thing i'll say is if there is a developing dementia and that then that vulnerability to scams is only going to increase because dementia is progressive. So it is going to get worse. And so if you set those things up now, even if we're still feeling like we're in the natural aging process, maybe a mild cognitive impairment, you'll be more prepared for when this does happen. So thank you. I have no idea what time it is, but hopefully I'm okay with time. And if you have any questions, I am happy to share. Um, I do have, like I mentioned, I have a different PowerPoint that has a little more context on it that I can certainly have um, sent out so you can see that. So thank you.